Chapter 80 A Rain of Red and Yellow You are listening at NovelFull.audio Hannah, Riley D. Dad Even with the smoke still covering the air in a dark cloud, White King was there to receive his children as soon as they landed on the ground. The other students that joined the rescue event, as well as the academy staff that played the role of the civilians, were also there surrounding the building. They were the ones closest to the scene of the crime and they wanted to do something, but before they could even act, it was already over when the member of the Dark Millennium committed suicide. H. How, how could they have entered the academy? Hannah quickly bellowed as she rushed to hug White King. If this wasn't confirmation that Riley and Hannah truly were White King's children, then they don't know what is. We don't know yet, White King shook his head, letting out a short but deep sigh as he looked towards Riley, but if it wasn't for your brother, then there would definitely be more casualties. We found their other members planting bombs all over the academy, if Riley didn't report to us when he did. Anyone would have reported what I found, White King, Riley only glanced at his father before looking towards the sky, I, just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Even so, White King breathed out, your luck saved a lot more lives than you think. Everyone. White King's words then reverberated through the speakers as he raised his voice, please remain put where you are as we try to find if there are more members of the Dark Millennium inside the Academy. We. White King, please respond. White King here, White King's words were then disrupted as a voice transferred to his receiver. We have an unidentified projectile moving towards the academy, can you confirm with your satellite? And without even saying another word, White King immediately raised his arm and tapped the screen of the tablet wrapped around it multiple times, I see it. With its speed, it shouldn't be a prob fuck. H. Hey. Hannah could not help but back away as White King's cape suddenly hardened, before shaping into some sort of wing, but instead of a violent flap, a thunderous explosion erupted from behind White King's leg. Instantly launching him towards the air. All available super of grade dot B and above, we need you outside the academy. Affirmative, White King. Can we confirm what projectile? It's not a projectile. It's a fucking plane. M, mommy, what's going on? S, shoo, it's all right. It's all right, honey. Janice was now currently trying her best to scooch in between the seats, hiding her daughter from whatever it was that was happening. They heard some sort of loud bang coming from the front of the plane. She thought it was just some sort of turbulence, but when the plane suddenly shifted, most of the people started to panic. M, mom. Please. Please keep quiet. Mommy's here, okay. Mommy's here. I won't. This is your captain speaking. Next stop, Mega Academy. And before Janice could finish comforting Julie, the people once again started to scream as a weird announcement reverberated through the entire plane. Most of the people finally realized what was happening. They were being hijacked. N. No. And then once again, the people started to scream as some of them started pointing towards the front. Janice quickly looked to see what was happening, only to see the young man he was talking to earlier. Being lifted by the neck by one of the flight attendants, who was now wearing some sort of motorcycle helmet. R. Riley. Everyone, stay in your seats, the flight attendant's monotonous voice then whispered into all of their ears, if you don't, then I will start killing you one by one. Starting with this rat here. No. Please don't. Janice quickly stepped out to the aisle as soon as she heard the flight attendant's words, why? And before Janice could even finish her words, an orchestra of gasps entered her ears as the flight attendant plunged her hand straight through the young man's chest. W, why? And without even saying another word, the flight attendant threw the young man in front of Janice before heading back to the cockpit. N, no, you, please, please, no, Janice lightly patted the young man on the chest several times. Her mind, at a loss as to what to do. M, mommy. What's, what's happening to the angel? D, don't look, honey. 
Janice then quickly went back to her daughter and hugged her, he's, he's going to be alright, we're going to be alright. Help me slow it down. I'll go inside. Are you crazy? That thing is moving like a thousand kilometers per hour. 620 mph, does it matter? White King was currently floating in the sky, a few kilometers away from USMA. There were also six other people from the academy, including Scarlet Mage. Scarlet Mage, can you try removing all the air within a 500 meter radius? That's. I'll try, Scarlet Mage quickly nodded as she looked in a certain direction, but I need to concentrate all my powers. Green Fly, focus on carrying Scarlet Mage. No problem. The rest of you get ready. As soon as the plane enters within the no air radius, slow it down enough so I can enter the plane. Roger that. Even with the wind threatening to scrape their faces off, no one seemed to be faltering as they all looked in the same direction. A second, a minute. And soon, the silhouette of the plane showed itself. And without even saying a word to each other, the veins on Scarlet Mage's neck and face started to etch through her skin, crawling across her entire body, her now silver hair moving in a static as her eyes turned gray. She then stretched her trembling hands, and with the release of her breath, it was as if the air in front of them became peaceful. A thunderous explosion then erupted through their ears as White King thrust towards the incoming airplane, the three others were also flying from behind him, but soon deviated to the side. White King's entire body then rotated horizontally, and as it did so, several drones shot out from his costume, and as he stopped and stretched his limbs, the drone flew like rockets towards the plane. The drones seemed like they had a life of their own as they attached themselves to the sides of the plane, effectively slowing it down gradually. And as soon as it reached a certain speed, the three remaining supers flew towards the plane's wings and nose. They were careful not to move against the plane too much, in fears that it would crumble. With the plane now at 25% of its original speed, White King propelled himself to the plane's door, attaching some sort of instrument on it before it automatically opened for him. The three supers slightly crumpled that part of the plane they were holding at it shifted from the sudden change of turbulence, but they were able to easily stabilize it to allow White King to enter. Dot. 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 White King, what's the status of the passing? Go back to the academy now. Wah. The plane. It's empty. Mommy's here, mommy's here. W, what's happening, mommy? Shoo, shoo, it's all right. Mommy's here. Janice was now seated back at her seat, cradling her daughter in her arms as she looked outside through the window. She then turned to look at the body of the young man, before closing her eyes and embracing her daughter even tightly. It's all right, honey, we're going to be all right, but what, what about Mr. Angel? Mommy. He, well, he's in heaven now, okay. Heaven. Can we meet him there, mommy? N, no, hearing her daughter's words, the tears that Janice was trying to stop finally trailed on her cheeks, not yet, please not yet. Mommy. Janice once again opened her eyes as she looked at the window, and seeing the buildings now so close to them, the only thing she could do was close it before hugging her daughter even tighter. M.O. Mommy loves you, okay. Mommy loves you very much, always, always remember that. I. I love you too, mom. The tiny voice and her last words. The last message of a mother to her daughter. These two, were only a fraction of the voices that the world will never be able to hear again. Oh. Oh my, God. No, no. What, what the fuck is happening? Red and yellow. All of the eyes inside the academy reflected the colors red and yellow as they all looked above. The sound of thunder filled their eyes as smoke slowly started to envelop in a dome, covering their sky in darkness. It was all too sudden, and only some of them saw what truly happened. And those who did have their hearts now trembling. It, it was a plane, Sylvie then whispered. 
Just a few moments ago, she and the others were checking up on Hannah when she heard a whistling whisper into her ear. And as soon as she looked up, she saw the silhouette of a plane flying towards the academy, and without even having the time to react, she saw it being flattened as it made contact with the academy's dome barrier. Dot a plane. L, look. Gary then pointed towards a certain direction in the sky, and although it was quite hard to see from the distance, those who had enhanced eyesight were able to quickly recognize what he was pointing to. Isn't that, a person? There was a person hanging on the dome, but before they could even say another word. His blood and guts smeared as a part of the plane squashed him. N, no, no. Dot. And as the situation finally registered in everyone's mind, another explosion erupted. And this time, everyone was able to see what crashed into the dome. Another plane. Wah. And before they could even breathe out a gasp. Another explosion erupted. And another, another. And another. Chapter 81. The last light you are listening at novel full dot audio. Seven planes. Seven planes to that signaled the abrupt end of the festival. A festival that was supposed to bring the future superheroes of the world together, ended in the deaths of probably more than 900 people. Of course, that number was just an estimate, there could be less, there could be more. But now, the only thing in the minds of the students is how helpless they were in the situation as the sky above them was filled with nothing but darkness and pain. Just a few moments ago, they were cheering and howling for glory, but now the only thing that remained was a silent bitterness. A regret that they could do nothing about. They were supposed to be heroes, but the only thing they could do was watch as hundreds of people died above them. The Dark Millennium aimed for this. They could have aimed from anywhere within the academy, but they crashed the planes right on top where the majority of the people were gathered, they wanted them to see what they were capable of doing. These were the thoughts of most of the students, N, no. We, we need to help them. Sylvie, who was still inside the Colosseum with the others, quickly snapped out of her thoughts as her feet began to float from the ground. Where are you going, Sylve? Gary quickly stretched his arms to block Sylvie as she flew away, but his arm was quickly swatted away. I'm going out. Sylvie yelled as a skirt of wind traveled across her body, propelling her directly outside the Colosseum. Dot she's going to the gate, Hannah breathed out before her feet were engulfed in flames, I'm going with her. W, wait, we should wait for the instructors. Ah, uh, god damn it. The only thing that Gary could do was jump to the top of the Colosseum to try and chase the two, leaving Riley and Tomo with the rest of the students. The number of the students dwindled, however, as most of them chased to follow Sylvie, if there were any hopes that there were survivors, then the least they should be able to do was to help them. Should we go and follow them, Master? With most of the students gone, Tomo carefully approached Riley and stood behind him, her voice only traveling through Riley's ears. The Dark Millennium, did they do this because they wanted to take revenge on you? Tomo then said as she looked at the cloud of darkness above them, there were still some parts of the airplanes hanging on the invisible force field, but with the dome not offering in friction, it will only be another moment for them to fall to the sides, they said they were doing what they were doing to save humanity, but look at them, killing all of these people just to pretend that they actually have a chance to reach your heights. A bunch of hypocrites. Oh. I apologize, Tomo. M, M, Master. Tomo's body instantly straightened like a pole as Riley suddenly leaned closer to her, placing his face just a few inches away from touching her ears. Tomo was trying her best not to faint even with all the redness that crawled through her face, you were not privy to the information because you were only the second subordinate. H. H. M. This is my doing. W. What? Let's go, Tomo. We need to make sure no one survived. B. Blurg. W. Why? Why do something like this? Dark Millennium, they will pay for this. Ants. From the view above, the students of the academy that forced themselves through the gate looked like ants that were trying to drag leftovers back to their nest. 
The academy guards initially wanted to stop Sylvie as she was the first to be asked to leave, but when the rush of students started appearing, the only thing they could do was open the gate, as they seemed adamant to the point that they would probably destroy it. However, they too were not ready for the destruction that rained down upon them. The land area of the academy was its own city with its size. But even then, there were debris falling everywhere as they slid from the invisible dome. The weirdest thing is as if the heavens were mocking them, as most of the debris seemed to have slid and rolled near the academy gates. There were already instructors and some staff of the academy searching for survivors. But judging by the looks on their faces, they have not been successful yet. Dot. Sylvie carefully lifted a large chunk of the plane away, only for her eyes to be welcomed by the scenery of several charred bodies stuck to each other. Those who were near her could not help but take in a small but deep gasp, almost to the point that their chests exploded. This was a mistake, however, as the smell of the roasted bodies fumed through their noses. Herc. And so, once again, the retching sounds of the students whispered in the air. As for Sylvie, her hand trembled uncontrollably, not knowing whether she should let go of the debris and cover the bodies or wait for someone to move them away. She tried to cover their bodies, but as soon as the sound of their skin crackling whispered through her ears, the only thing she could do was close her eyes. Sylvie, remove it. Her rapid thoughts were then disrupted as Hannah passed by her, quickly covering the bodies with blankets that she got from the guards. Dot. Sylvie watched her for a few seconds, before letting out a small breath and nodding, T, thank you. Snap out of it, Sylvie. You're the school's number one student, remember? I. Sylvie was about to say something, but as soon as she saw Hannah's trembling hands, she could not help but take in another deep breath, let's, search for survivors, she then once again closed her eyes, and as she did so, the cries, the screams, the panic, and the sorrow became silent. What remained were the hearts that drummed erratically through her ears. She tried desperately to hear a different beat. Weak, tormented, and in need of rescue. But alas, she could hear no such pain. Dot. Sylvie bit her lip as she finally realized, there probably weren't any survivors here. Father. Why, did you leave? We're, too late. Sylvie's thoughts were then disrupted by Hannah's sudden bellows. She carefully put the giant debris she was holding to the side before turning towards where Hannah rushed to, only to see White King and the others descending from the sky. White King. White King could have probably stopped this from happening, along with Scarlet Mage and the others they were with. So why, why were they gone? Why did you leave? Hannah repeated her words, you, you could have saved some of. There, was another plane, the tone of White King's voice was sedated, his helmet slowly opening and revealing his face to the others. F, father. Another plane. Did you, manage to save them? It was empty. What? Sylvie, who was quietly listening from the side, could not help but join in on the conversation, did, the Dark Millennium use it to lure you away from the academy. Dot. Bernard only looked at Sylvie and nodded, before rushing to help the others in trying to find survivors. At least just one. If they could at least just find one. Just a single light in the darkness to tell them what truly happened. I. I think we have one here. Dot. Sylvie and Hannah quickly looked towards the sound of the voice, only to see Gary waving his hands at them. She, we think she's breathing. And as soon as they heard his words, the two quickly rushed towards him. Where? We need a medic here. Hannah quickly bellowed, garnering the attention of the other people. A child. Where, Gary? A smile slowly crawled on Sylvie's face, her breaths finally replacing the sorrow stuck inside her lungs. T, there. Riley is taking care of her. Sylvie and Hannah quickly looked towards where Gary was pointing to, and there, they saw Riley gently carrying a small girl in his arms. Her eyes, still trembling. R. 
Riley, Hannah could not help but take in a small gulp as she saw her brother carrying someone, never in her life did she see Riley being that close to another human other than her, and to see him with a sorrowful look on his face, her eyes almost could not stop the tears that were wanting to burst out from them. How, how is she? Shu, Riley placed his finger on his lips before softly pointing towards the small child. Ah. Uh. Angel. Dot. Sylvie, Gary, and Hannah sedated their hurried steps as soon as they heard the weak breaths coming from the small child. Is, is that you, Angel? Sylvie could not help but cover her mouth as a small gasp escaped from her mouth, her hands trembling as her tears fell upon them. Finally, through all this sorrow and madness. Finally dot there was light in the dark. Cook. Dot. Sylvie's gasps completely ceased as red once again painted itself in front of her. She slowly touched her face, only to see her tears now mixed with the blood. Blood that gushed from the little girl's mouth like rain. No. No. Sylvie's screams, rippling through the air, as if signaling that their last light has now completely withered. Dot. 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 Catherine, are you still there? That I am, Mom. Tears. Tears fell on Catherine's face as she watched Riley and the others from afar, her voice slightly trembling as she seemed to be talking with her mother through her phone. The, the news just came up. All, all those people. That I know, Mom. I'm here. And, no, oh my God. I'm. I'm so sorry, Catherine. We still have a lot to do, Mom, please call back later. W, wait, please wait. What about your friend? Is he alright? Dot he's alright, Mom. He's, alright. Did you find him? He, didn't get on the plane. That's, oh my God, thank God. Thank God. That's good, that's good. Dot. I. I wouldn't be able to fall asleep knowing I was the one who got him on the plane. I. I bought the ticket for him, after all. I, was the one to ask you to do that, Mom. But even so. Mom, please. Please don't tell this to anyone. Oh, of course, honey. A lot of people died, it would be spitting on their faces if. Thank you. Mom. I. I need to go. Okay, please, please be safe, okay. Mom. I love you. Dot. Dot I love you too, honey. Eat your meals, okay. Don't stay up too late, call me if it gets too hard. Goodbye, Mom. HM. Goodbye, Kathy. Chapter 82 the Morality of Strength You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. 4. 160.9. Dot. Dot. Can they, even identify half of these bodies? With the number of students reaching almost 5,000, including the ones from the other countries, all the debris and mangled parts of the plane were quickly cleared out even before the sun went down. The students were all initially tormented and weakened by what happened not even daring to touch the debris as there could be a body buried beneath it. But after a few hours, some of them were even carrying the charred bodies of those who died. The expressions of the students were still grim, but the anger and resolution burning in their eyes were enough to wash away any signs of weakness they had. 469 Bodies The students and the numerous staff of the academy have lined up 469 bodies. And those were the ones that were still, salvageable. According to the media outlets that were now reporting the news, there should be a total of 942 passengers on the seven planes that crashed. All were domestic flights, with people just wanting to get to their destination, with people just wanting to get home. We think, this is her mother. Dot. Dot. And right now, Riley, Hannah, and the others were gathered in front of one of those charred bodies, but lying beside the skin of black and red, was the child that died in Riley's arms. Her body, was wrapped around the little girl when we found her, 
Gary then muttered as he crouched down, gently moving the body of the little girl closer to her mother. Thought we were supposed to protect them, Sylvie whispered. There was no way we could have, Hannah muttered as she held Sylvie's trembling hand, the dark millennium planned all of this, every little detail. There are almost a hundred veteran superheroes in the academy, but to think no one was able to do anything, Gary then let out a small but deep sigh as he stood up, they are as much to blame for this. That I don't think that's fair, Hannah quickly replied, no one expected this to happen. Your father could have. You. But as you said, the dark millennium planned for everything, Gary continued, they lured him away with the first plane. The Dark Millennium knew enough about your father that they knew he was going to take action there. Dark Millennium, just what exactly is their goal? They're just terrorists with more money, Sylvie answered, and after what they did today, the Hope Guild will probably take action to wipe them out. Dot. Hannah only nodded at Sylvie's words before turning to look at the hundreds of bodies lined up on the horizon, 15 million. Hmm. This is 469, Hannah muttered, Dark Day killed 15 million in one day. Just, just how do you think it would look like if 15 million dead bodies were laid in front of us? This time, Tomo joined in on the conversation, the look on her face was completely monotonous, the entire land area of the academy will be covered, there's a video about it on the internet that dot dot. None of them knew what to reply to Tomo, whether or not they would get mad at her or be amazed as to how calm she was considering the situation, but seeing as her monotonous voice was even more robotic than before, it would seem she was also affected in some way. You know. Gary then once again let out a sigh as he looked at the little girl, none of this would have happened if they had our strength and durability, Sylvie. What? If you were offered to give your strength away for the sake of everyone else having a fraction of your power, Gary then looked Sylvie straight in the eyes, would you do it? Give, my strength away. They would only need a fraction of your power to survive something like this. Why are you asking something like that here, you fucker? Hannah furrowed her eyebrows as she slightly got in between the two. Sylvie, however, gently patted her on the shoulder to tell her it was alright. I, probably would, Sylvie answered. I believe I gained my powers for the sake of helping people, and if I could prevent deaths like this from happening, then I would gladly give it away. H.M. Did I even need to ask? Gary then let out a small chuckle as he once again looked at the little girl, probably would do the same if it means saving the truly weak and helpless. Noticing the two looking at her, Hannah could only let out a small but deep breath, I think I would as well. I didn't want the responsibility of being a hero in the first place, what about you, Tomo? That I don't know, Tomo shook her head, I, feel my powers would be more useful if I am the one using them. Dot. 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 What about you, Riley? Sylvie then turned her eyes towards Riley, who had been keeping quiet and just staring at the little girl throughout their conversation. Julie. Hmm. The child's name is Julie, Riley then said as he finally took his eyes away from the little girl. Julie, did she tell you before she died? Yes, and her mother's name is Janice, Riley then shook his head as he finally joined the group, what was your question again, Sylvie? If, you could have saved all of these people by giving them your abilities, but in turn give away your power. Would you have done it? No, Riley quickly answered. Can I ask why? Dot. Riley did not answer immediately, but instead looked towards the horizon of dead bodies, out of all these people, how many do you think are bad people? Riley. Hannah wanted to stop her brother from saying any more, but seeing the solemn look in his eyes that seeped from the side of his sunglasses, the only thing she could do was halt her steps. I. I don't know, Sylvie stuttered, what if they were all good people? One, Sylvie, Riley then said as he turned his face toward Sylvie, all you need is one monster to have your powers, and the rest of the world will suffer for it. And without a mega woman. Or in this case, without an American mega girl to stop her, him, or them, what do you think will happen? Then, 
the other people who gained my abilities can stop them. There is a difference between having a superpower and being a superhero, Sylvie, Riley then breathed out, out of all these people, how many do you think will step up and stop him? I. 1. Riley once again repeated, but this time, he pointed towards the charred body of Julie, out of all the 942 passengers, only one of them deserves to have your power. Or at least that's how Mega Woman would have answered if she was here. Dot. Dot. How, do you know so much about Mega Woman, bro? Gary then let out a small but deep sigh before looking at the rest of the people, most of whom were now sitting on the ground, completely exhausted from all the death they had to carry in their minds. Eddie E.T. Anyway, we should probably. W. What? What do you mean gone? Riley and the group were about to return inside the academy when a series of clamors and shouts suddenly started roaring in the air, most of the people that were shouting had their phones in front of them, and most were the foreign students. And as soon as Tomo saw this, she quickly checked her phone to turn on the news, trying to see if there was any other news besides what happened to Mega Academy, but found that what happened to Mega Academy was not even on top of the featured news feed anymore. Gee. Guys, Tomo's monotonous voice slightly faltered as she called for the others, her eyes, however, were completely fixed on Riley, look, look at this. What is it? Hannah was the first to look over her shoulder to see what caused Tomo to get riled up, her eyes quickly widening as soon as she saw the headline on the video Tomo was watching, what, the fuck? What's going on? Sylvie muttered, but she too, let out a deep gasp as she saw what the others were looking at. The last one to check was Gary, who could only curse before looking at the foreign students. It wasn't just 942 people. The death toll wasn't just 942 people. H. How? How could this happen? What do they mean collapsed? But, my brother, my brother is. Dark millennium, never. I would never forgive them. And soon, even though their numbers were just a fraction of the students of USMA, their voices were the only ones that could be heard. Most of the students of USMA could not understand what they were saying, but the anguish contained in their voices was enough for their feelings to reach deep into their cores. Dot. While Gary, Sylvie, and Hannah were still busy watching the news, Tomo's eyes were still stuck on Riley, who seemed to be completely free of any worries as he was just looking nowhere in particular. Tomo knew. She knew that Riley was capable of even greater evil than this. Like a crazed fan, she idolized him for years even fully knowing what kind of person he was. But now that she was seeing him standing there as if he did not do what he just did. Tomo finally realized how far her reality was from him. The death toll wasn't just 942 people. 25,671, that is the total combined number of students, instructors, supers, and staff inside the other mega academies. 26,613, that is the number of deaths that would be pronounced at the end of this tragedy. Mega Woman Riley then looked towards the sky before closing his eyes, I wonder. If you'll thank me for removing them if you're here. Chapter 83 Say hi you are listening at novelfull.audio. Dot dot. A week had passed since the events that ever so slightly shook the entire world, and the students of Mega Academy were once again asked to rest in their dorms. But unlike last time during the abduction event courtesy of the Dark Millennium, they were allowed to go outside of their rooms and explore the academy grounds. But once again, less than half of the student population didn't leave their room. Some requested that they be taken where their parents are, but the academy said that they will be taking their family inside the academy instead. As per quote, it is still one of the safest places in the world. The students begged to disagree, but when a bunch of supers all around the world started appearing within the academy grounds in order to guard them, the only thing the students could do was nod their heads. As for the foreign students from the other mega academies, there were already plans of officially transferring them to the academy, and like with the rest, their families were now en route towards them and will be staying in the academy for an indefinite amount of time until everything is settled. 
Even though they have watched and read it being repeated in the news over and over again, they still could not believe that the other mega academies were no more. They just said that they all imploded all at the same time. Burying anything and anyone beneath it. Of course, none of them believed that everyone could have died with just that. As there were heroes there that were capable of surviving even the extreme pressures of the deep sea a hundred times over. But no, the news reported that everything was crushed, almost flattened. Just how, how can the dark millennium be capable of something like this? The government and the Mega Academy were also already drawing the attention of the critics, with some even requesting to shut down their operations as not even months have passed and tragedy already struck down. The people were starting to wonder if the government really had the capacity of protecting the future generations of heroes. Shit. Hannah and the others were once again in their usual meeting spot. The Korean shaved ice store, their silence and size, almost melting down anything that was served there. Why are we even here if we're not going to have classes and train? Gary then lightly tapped the table as he clicked his tongue, it's been a week, we should just move on. People die every time. 150,000 per day according to the internet. We should be learning how to kick the ass of those dark millennium fuckers instead of just lazing around here. Dot. This time, even Hannah did not have the energy to respond to Gary's words, she wanted to be strong, but remembering all the bodies and the sound of their skin crackling made Hannah not even use her abilities even once since it happened. Your brother's not with you guys. The solemn group then all turned their heads as Charlotte suddenly approached their table, placing a cup of flavored shaved ice in front of each of them. We, didn't order any. On the house. And before Sylvie could even say anything, Charlotte's loud sighs pierced their ears, you're inside the store, it's awkward for the other customers if you're not eating anything. But there aren't any other custom. Do you want to die? Charlotte grabbed Gary's neck before he could even finish his words. You, just who are you? Hannah ignored that Gary was almost choking to death, and instead looked Charlotte straight in the eyes. With them not even bothering to wear their costumes anymore, Hannah's light brown eyes clearly reflected the interiors of the store, her ash dot brown hair, curling in its ends as they flowed on her shoulders. What do you mean? Charlotte blinked a couple of times as she finally dropped Gary on the ground. You were there during the rescue event, you. Impossible. Charlotte quickly shook her head and laughed, I was busy serving the customers here. Dot. The. Where's your brother? Charlotte did not let Hannah finish her words as she once again repeated her question, I even got a special mango Graham to cheer him up. He's with the police force. Tomo, who had been quiet the whole time, grabbed the mango Graham reserved for Riley as she answered Charlotte, they are still doing rounds outside the perimeter of the academy. C. Gary sprung up from the floor as he once again patted the table, at least Riley is doing something. We should be helping them instead or training. The academy is already working out solutions with the government along with the student council on how to proceed, Gary, Sylvie sighed, a lot of things are going to change after this, the foreign students, our family staying within academy grounds, I even heard they are thinking of letting us out of the academy more frequently with our future lessons. Student Council Hannah squinted as she took a bite of her shaved ice, I forgot the academy established that. I thought you joined. No, Sylvie let out an awkward chuckle, I don't think I will be suited in politics even at a lower scale. I see. Hannah also let out a chuckle of her own, followed by an awkward silence as the group tried to act normal. Ack. Until when are we going to do something? Gary's loud groans of frustration quickly broke the silence, I would be happy if we were like in a normal school, but we're in a cool school where we beat each other up. Fine, Charlotte, who saw the downcast looks of the group, could not help but once again let out a sigh, I'll let you in on a little secret. You might be stuck doing nothing for a while. W. What? This time, not only Gary reacted wildly, but also Hannah and Sylvie, with Tomo only raising an eyebrow in curiosity. The government is trying their best to keep it in wraps, 
but they are currently dealing with the dark millennium with zero tolerance. They already found some of their bases in the sky. Zero, tolerance. HM, Charlotte nodded with a smile, even Dark Millennium had already announced that they have no connection with Dark Day or whatsoever, they will be still treating them as such. Any super or organization that even expresses to continue where Dark Day left off are to be dealt with the same as him, zero tolerance. What, are you saying? Sylvie muttered as she stood up. Hope Guild and other grade.s and as supers, will be annihilating Dark Millennium from the face of the planet. They have already caught some of them. Sylve. Hannah then also stood up as she grabbed her phone, quickly dialing her father's number, I think she meant it literally. You mean. They. Gary whispered, that are executing all of them. R, are you sure I'll be safe here? Of course. In a dark hallway, a pair of steps could be heard echoing almost rhythmically, with Mr. Friday looking around at the path they have been walking on for almost a full hour now. And even with his suit, it still felt a little cold. It was also a bit hard to see with the helmet he was wearing, it was a good thing that the young man walking in front of him had hair that almost brightened up the hallway. How, are you outside the academy? Mr. Friday muttered, I thought students weren't allowed to go outside. The white dot haired man then stopped walking as he glanced at Mr. Friday, I am still in the academy, Mr. Friday, he then said, you must be mistaking me with Riley. I am Riley too, or as I like to call myself. Dilly. Dot. Get it. Because D means two. Dot. Mr. Friday could not help but hold his breath as he saw the look in Riley. On Dilly's face. Was, was he supposed to laugh? Dilly currently had a wide smile on his face, enough to reach from ear to ear. Dot, he, he. And as soon as Mr. Friday let out a fake laugh, Dilly immediately nodded and once again continued to walk. Does Riley's clone have, different personalities? Mr. Friday continued to follow Dilly through the hallway. Just before this, they were inside some kind of elevator for almost a full ten minutes. Just, how deep does this place actually go? He doesn't even know where they are, as Dilly covered his head with a huge paper bag on the way. And finally, after a few minutes more, the dark hallway started to brighten up. And soon, their path was blocked by a glass door. We're here. R, right, Mr. Friday once again nodded as he followed Dilly inside. You'll be taking care of them whenever I am gone. So please, be on your best behavior. We don't want to set up a bad example. Take care of. And before Mr. Friday could even finish his words, he could not help but slightly take a few steps back as he saw almost a hundred glass boxes neatly littered in his view, all with humans confined inside of them. This. Come, let me tour you around. And from now on, you will be known as Warden. Oh. Of course, Warden's feet moved on their own as he once again followed Dilly, stepping down some stairs before they reached the first platform. This is our very first occupant, Warden, Dilly then stopped as they reached a glass cage, you may know him as Replica Ricky, but I don't think he was quite known. Say hi to our new caretaker, Replica Ricky. Dot. I said to say hi, Replica Ricky. Dilly then lightly tapped Replica Ricky's cage, and as soon as he did so, Replica Ricky stood up, his face completely terrified before turning his eyes towards Warden, H, hi. Dot hi. Just. Warden whispered in his mind, dot what the fuck is this? Chapter 84. Hotel Riley you are listening at novel full dot audio. Warden could feel his hands slowly going numb, waving it towards the reluctant greetings of the numerous supers he had been passing by for almost a minute now. A minute. It has only been a minute since he had been waving his hand and it already felt numb. How could it not, when all he wanted to do was drop his hand and look away from the faces that seemed to have not seen sunlight for years? None of them looked emaciated, with their flesh still seemingly filled with life. 
Their eyes, however, showed utter despair as it felt like even the bright hall they were in did not reflect on them. And with Dilly's every tap on their glass cage, they all scurried to greet him as if they were some kind of, submissive pet. This continued on for another dozen or so cage, until finally. Get me out of here. I see you, you lunatic. A loud scream could be heard through the endless sorrowful breaths, I see. Wait, you, are you from the dark millennium? Ms. Friday. Warden could not help but halt in his steps as he saw a woman struggling to smash the glass cage she was in. You, did you get captured as well? Ms. Friday's breaths quickly became fettered as soon as she saw Warden's jet dot black helmet. Oh right, Dilly then clapped his fist as he looked back and forth between the two, you two know each other. No, each other. You, wait. Aren't you number seven? Ms. Friday once again slammed her fists on the glass cage. He's not number seven anymore, Dilly let out a disappointed sigh as he placed his hand on Warden's shoulder, he's your new caretaker, you may call him Warden. He will be the one responsible for all of you for now. Warden. Ms. Friday raised an eyebrow as she heard Dilly's words, but after a few more moments, her eyebrows started to nod, you, sold us out. How could you? Ms. Friday then once again slammed her fists. This time not stopping until her hands almost bled. Dot. Dilly only glanced at her before shaking his head, you two seem to have some catching up to do. W, wait. You're leaving me here already. Warden bellowed, what, what do I even do here? You'll figure it out on your own eventually, Dilly glanced at Warden as he continued to walk away, also, the next time we meet, don't let me catch you wearing that helmet again. Dot. Dot. Warden could only hold his breath as he watched as Dilly left, casually waving his hand as he did so. How dare you! And as soon as any trace of Dilly was gone, Miss Friday's voice once again echoed throughout the bright hall. How dare I! And this time, Warden responded, you were the one who tied me in shackles and tortured me. Because you're a traitor. You killed all those, all those children. Miss Friday screamed, but, but you can still redeem yourself, get me out of here. Get us all out of here. Redeem. Warden let out a loud scoff, before proceeding to remove his helmet, the sides of his hair were shaved, with the top pulled back in a decent length. And with the small scars scattered on his face and his tired middle dot aged face, one would probably mistake him to have served in the military, and perhaps he did. There is nothing to redeem, Miss Frid. No. There is nothing to redeem, Ellie. H, how do you know my name? Did you? Dark Millennium is done for, Warden breathed out, Hope Guild and other grade. S and the supers are hunting them down one by one, there is nothing to redeem. That's I'm, impossible. How could they do that when our leader is Dark Da? Are you still in denial after being locked up in here for months? Warden did not let Ellie finish her words as he gestured to the rest of the glass cages, our leader isn't Dark Day. We flew so close to the fire. And now the real one swatted us down like insects. That's. I already had an idea on who Riley could be. I have just been denying it. But after seeing all of this. That young man really is Dark Day. Dot. Hearing Warden's words, Ellie shook her head numerous times. Of course, she knew who he was. How could she not when she was surrounded by supers abducted by Dark Day? She. She was just trying to go through the eye of a needle, trying to convince herself that the truth is not what it seemed. After all. What's worse than being caged by the evilest villain the world has ever known? All that talk about saving humanity. Warden then whispered, I knew it was too good to be true. Whoever was pretending to be our leader, he. She couldn't be more different than Dark Day. Dark Day, is a monster. He, he is. Ellie let out a crazed chuckle, now get us out here. We, we will expose him to the world. Do you know what he did last week? 
Warden, however, completely ignored Ellie's ramblings as he turned around, seven planes. Seven planes filled to the brim with passengers. All those innocent people, he made them crash straight to USMA. W, what? Almost a thousand innocent people, dead. That's, then even more, we should stop. And then he blew up the rest of the other mega academies, more than 25,000 people dead in one day. And he pinned all the blame to the dark millennium. What? Even if you go out there, they will kill you on sight, Ellie, Warden breathed out, all our identities have been exposed to the government. They know our family, our friends, our favorite food. What? Ellie repeated her distress as she took a few steps back, the stands of her already disheveled blonde hair, splitting as she scrunched it with her hands, and, no. All of this happened, because you, you betrayed us. She then bellowed as she pointed at Warden, all those deaths, they are on you. I did what I had to survive, Ellie, Warden then said as he once again faced Ellie, maybe if you lived the life I did, you would. What's happening, Warden's words were cut short as a loud beeping sound started to echo through the entire hall, and soon, a small rumbling could be heard. I. I will kill you, Ellie's furrowed eyebrows soon relaxed as the tears hanging on her eyes could no longer hold themselves anymore. W. What? Warden then took a few steps back as Ellie's glass cage slowly opened up. However, he wouldn't be too nervous if it was just that. Not only Ellie's, but all of the cages opened up at the same time. It's lunchtime, Warden, Ellie said as she let out a smile. L. Lunch. Warden took in a small gulp, wait, am I here to be eaten? Are you people so starved that you would eat me? Everyone. Ellie then screamed as she waved her hand, let's kill this fool and get out of here. He has access to the outside. Even if we don't use our powers, we can gang up on him. Ellie started to burst out in laughter as she slowly walked towards Warden. Wait. Don't force me to kill any of you, please. Warden stuttered as blue chains of light emerged from his arms. Ellie continued to laugh as the other supers started to approach. Her laugh, however, quickly faded away as they just passed by them. W, guys. Ellie grabbed one of the super's arms, only for his hand to be swatted away. The super, only glancing at her before looking away without any expression on his face. Ellie, even after more than a month of being held captive, did not lose hope. As long as the Dark Millennium existed, there was a chance that she would be rescued. But hearing what she heard from Warden, the last light that was still flickering in her eyes was slowly being swooshed away. What's going on? As for Warden, he could not help but let out a sigh of relief as the super prisoners ignored him. He took a look at the frenzied Ellie one last time, before deciding to follow where the others were heading to. Warden's eyes, however, could not help but take in a small but deep breath as they passed through another glass door. The new hall, filled with foliage and trees. If it wasn't for the white bright wall surrounding their perimeter, then he would have thought they were outside. One of the prisoners then stepped outside the line, before kneeling to the ground and placing both her hands on the ground. Warden was confused if he needed to do something, but before he could even make a decision, the ground started to tremble. F, fuck, Warden was about to stop the woman, but as soon as he saw some of the trees that have already withered away come back to life, he quickly retracted the blue chains of light crawling through the ground. The woman then glanced at him, before returning to her line like what she did was just part of their daily routine. As for the other super prisoners, they only took a short glance at the nature that suddenly befell their eyes, before once again moving like robots as they reached another glass door. What? And as they entered the glass door, the bright light that has been drowning Warden's eyes since earlier faded. Instead replaced by the dim light provided by candles, as well as the somber but elegant music that hummed in the air. This, a restaurant. He whispered as he watched the super prisoners one by one take a seat at the table seemingly molded with the most expensive of wood. There was also a band playing in the center of the hall. 
just. How is one man capable of doing and building something like this? And no matter how much he looked at it, the entire hall just seemed like some sort of fancy restaurant. And he would be right, as soon, a dozen or more people appeared. Carrying what seemed to be a menu. And the ones carrying them. Riley. A whole bunch of Riley Ross wearing a waiter's uniform. Warden then turned his attention towards the band, only to realize that the ones playing also looked like Riley Ross. Warden. Why, yes. His thoughts were then disrupted as one of the waiter Rileys approached him. We have already prepared a table for you. Please, follow me. Oh, of course, Warden could only nod as he followed waiter Riley to what seemed to be the grandest table in the hall. Also, for the bath later. Some of the guests are requesting to have access to the pool, would you like to allow them that leisure? What? The fuck? Volume 1 end high, that puts an end to Volume 1. Hope you like it so far since I really am enjoying writing this story, and I hope you continue to support my work even further as we go alone and the story turns even crazier. Although the story is not as famous as My Hermes System when it started, I will still make sure that I put as much or even more effort to this and try to avoid the mistakes I did there. So from the bottom of my stomach, seriously, thank you very much for supporting me. Riley Ross slash Dark Day's story is just getting started. With the other mega academies now destroyed, the foreign students that are in the academy has no choice but to assimilate themselves in a foreign school. As for who the leader of Dark Millennium is, maybe we will find out in the next volume. Will Riley stay in retirement? Will Mega Woman's location finally be found? What other secrets is the government hiding? And for that, what other secrets does Riley have in his arsenal? Find out in the next volume of Riley Ross C. Chapter 85 The Hope Guild, 1 you are listening at NovelFull.audio. Good work out there, Riley. Thank you, Scarlet Mage. A trembling hum gently roared through the air as USMA's colossal gates once again slowly blocked its view of the outside world. Riley closed his eyes as soon as he stepped back inside the academy, allowing Scarlet Mage to gently wipe his face even though there really was no need to. As no sweat or dirt could even be found resting on his skin. The other members of the police force were also expecting someone to assist them after a long day of hard work. But forget someone wiping their sweat and tears, there wasn't even anyone there to give them a towel. They have been trying to clean up the last remaining clutter from the accident outside the perimeter of the academy, yet not even a single person waited for them inside to welcome them back in. The only thing they could do was grit their teeth as they watched Riley being pampered by one of the hottest instructors in the academy. The events of what happened were still fresh in their mind, of course. But as they have been seeing dead bodies for almost a week now, they have grown numb to it, the least the academy could do was give them a scarlet mage of their own. They all thought. I'll, go ahead, Riley. Very well, Katrina. Dot. Katrina was also one of the students watching Riley in Scarlet Mage, but unlike most of them, she wasn't really interested in having someone to wipe her face. Instead, she was just looking at Riley, her eyes a bit solemn as she bid him farewell, next time, then. Next time. Riley muttered, but Katrina was already gone. It would seem you are getting famous, Riley Ross, Katrina let out a small chuckle as she finished wiping Riley's face and neck. Have I not always been popular, Catherine? Riley then started to walk towards where Catherine's car was parked, what's news on the destruction of the Dark Millennium? Only one base is left, Catherine quickly replied as she followed Riley, it would seem they're really not stopping until they wiped them all out, they even wanted to invite me. But they decided I was needed more in the academy instead, have they found the Dark Millennium's leader? Riley muttered, the one pretending to be Dark Day. No, not even a sign. Hmm, that is too bad, Riley then stepped inside Catherine's car, keeping quiet until Catherine also got inside, and what about Mega Woman? 
Have you made any progress in searching for her whereabouts, Catherine? Dot no, Catherine let out a sigh as soon as she heard Riley's question, and if I may speak honestly. You should just ask your father. No, I have already told you that my family's involvement in this should be minimal, Catherine. Your father is leading the annihilation of the Dark Millennium. I am pretty sure that is as involved as he could ever get, Catherine said as she started the car. Well, he could be in one of the cages, Riley quickly answered, then he would truly be involved with me, Catherine. Catherine has been quite curious as Riley has been mentioning cages and the others several times but did not really want to ask any further as she was already deep inside Riley's world too much already. So instead, she just started to drive away with another question, what about Sylvie? You said so yourself that she looks almost identical to Mega Woman, questioning her would have merit. She knows nothing, Catherine, Riley shook his head, but the person that probably knows something will be arriving in the academy soon. What do you mean? Sylvie's father. The students' families are arriving at the academy and will be staying indefinitely, correct? Riley muttered, perhaps we could set up a meeting with him. If he is indeed Sylvie's father, then he would most likely know where Mega Woman is as he is her lover. Did you also plan for this? No, I'm not my father, Catherine, Riley's sigh almost tickled Catherine's ears, I suppose we could just consider this as luck. Being lucky is not one of your abilities, is it? Like Lucky Chucky. No, Catherine, Riley squinted his eyes, there's someone out there with the ability to increase his luck. Yes. Interesting, Riley muttered, someday I will take you to see what other abilities I have, I am sure they will be delighted to meet you. Dot. Speaking of which, Catherine. I suppose you will be meeting my mother soon. What? Riley almost hit the barrier on his head on the dash as Catherine suddenly stepped on the brakes. It was a good thing he was wearing his seatbelt, as even he, the evilest villain known to man, knows that one should always wear your seatbelt. You will be meeting my mother soon, Catherine, Riley then repeated as he fixed his hair, it would seem my sister has been telling her everything about you and your previous desperate attempts to seduce me. What? She has been wanting to meet you, Catherine. I think the two of you will like each other, you're quite similar in some ways. What? What would we even be talking about? Is, this the last of them? A small gnawing crunched in the air, a woman's whisper accompanied it. The woman had her hair in a ponytail, wearing a tank top that revealed her chiseled stomach. But even with the lines surrounding her body, her skin was the most noticeable of all. It was gray. Gray skin, with veins that almost seemed transparent that one could see red flowing through them. And in her hands, was a man, whose neck was twisted in a way that should not be possible. And then, there was a beat. A beat echoing like a soft drum piercing the air as some sort of blur suddenly appeared in front of the woman, but soon, the blur turned into the form of a man. His body completely covered in a black suit, his seemingly transparent helmet, almost taking the shape of his head. His eyes could not be seen through his helmet, the green mustache that was plastered on his face, however, was pretty noticeable. Tempo. The gray dot skinned woman then slightly grunted as she saw the man, what the fuck are you doing here? White King asked me to check up on you, Hera, the man called Tempo quickly replied as he looked at the gray dot skinned woman, Hera, straight in the face. Why not check up on me himself? Hera clicked her tongue as she dropped the body he was holding to the ground. You know he always avoids you when you're in this berserk state, Tempo sighed, there's no using logic on you when you're like this. That I am learning to control my powers by the minute, thank you very much, Hera scoffed as she patted her hands clean of all the blood and dust around them. Really? Tempo breathed out as he turned his head towards the surrounding area, several houses within a 500-meter radius, blown to smithereens. Even buildings did not escape as craters formed like honeycombs, your dot target is only 42 people, Hera. And only 42 people are dead. Hera and Tempo. Two of the seven members of the leading superhero group in the world, the Hope Guild.
Chapter 86 The Hope Guild, 2, you are listening at NovelFull.audio. Your target is only 42 people, Hera. And only 42 people are dead. Hera crossed her arms as she nodded to herself in satisfaction. Tempo, on the other hand, could not help but once again look at the ruin she made. Although it's true that he was not seeing any other bodies besides the one sprawled on the floor near them, it feels like there were bound to be more dead people. That I think you did more than. Are you doubting my words, peasant? Hera did not let Tempo finish his words as she took a step towards him, I made sure to ask White King to have the others evacuated in a very sneaky manner before I let loose here. P, please calm down. T, the sons get. I am calm. H, hey, your fists. Your fists. Tempo's body started blurring as he took a few steps back, his fingers pointing towards Hera's fists, which were now trembling, the red veins crawling on them letting out a pulsing glow. And as soon as Hera realized her fists were trembling on their own, she quickly took in a long and very deep breath. And soon, her gray skin started to turn into its natural color. A light brown. Her muscles also started to calm down. Maybe too much as they completely almost disappeared, leaving only a slender and tall woman in its wake. See. Hera then let out a small scoff, I know how to control my abilities. R, right, Tempo breathed out as he slightly took another step back. Tempo, the others need you in Singapore. That's my cue to leave, W, wait. Stay chill, Hera. And as soon as Tempo's words reached Hera's ears, it was followed by the sound akin to that of skipping stones over a winter lake, echoing with some sort of ripple as Tempo's body could be seen flickering over the distance. Almost like rhythmic drum, a tempo. TCH, Hera then clicked her tongue as she watched Tempo disappear, what are you talking about, I'm always chill. Hera, the collateral damage you've inflicted is estimated to be $724,000000. Would you be paying that in check or installments? Fuck you, White King. Hera's skin instantly turned gray as she violently stomped her foot to the ground, causing a small earthquake and obliterating whatever building still stood within the vicinity as the honeycomb dot like craters began to merge into one huge crater. Dot. Dot. Dollar one, two hundred, four twenty, four forty four now. Dot. Dot. Bulwark will pay for it. And so, what do you guys need me for? An echoing drum once again thundered in the air as Tempo appeared in a blur, his eyes immediately surveying the surrounding area, and as soon as he saw a bald man, his body once again blurred before appearing next to the bald man. Unlike where Hera was, the area he was now in did not have that many houses or buildings, with only a single tall tower from afar being the only noticeable landmark. But instead, there were tents scattered everywhere. Ten minutes and twenty-four seconds, the bald man then quickly said as he looked at his watch, which was almost indiscernible with all the blood covering it, you are getting slow, Mr. Tempo. The bald man then turned his red eyes towards Tempo, before wiping the knife in his hands on his white uniform, which was similar to that of a chef's. That I have been running the whole day. I came all from Russia and this is how you treat M. Oh shit, Tempo could not help but let out a small gasp as he looked at the scenery behind the bald man, it was filled with corpses, their heads all separated from their bodies, wait till the media sees this, Tempo sighed. White King will. This is why I suggested for Butcher to stay home, or even better, kick him out of the team. And before the bald man could finish his words, a hissing sound whispered in the air as some sort of pearl dot colored humanoid robot landed in the ground, its surface almost like scales that were rattling with every minute movement. Its figure, almost towering tempo and the bald man by a full meter. I am here because I am 32% more efficient than any of you when it comes to lethal missions and assassinations, the bald man, Butcher, turned his red but almost dead dot like eyes towards the robot, unlike you, White King Light. W. White King Light. 
The scales of the humanoid robot rattled erratically before its torso split wide open, revealing a slightly petite woman wearing some sort of goggles. But even with the goggles covering her eyes, the green streaks of lightning that were emerging from her almond-shaped eyes were clear to see. Her feet, also letting out green sparks with every step she took towards Butcher. My name is V and you should tremble from my name. The petite woman roared, and I eliminated more targets than you buy, like a lot, go calculate that you emotionless bastard. You eliminated more targets, correct. But in the process, you also destroyed a lot, Butcher then pointed his knife towards an area on the horizon, which was similar to the damage that Hera made back in Russia. Does that even? All right, all right. Tempo then suddenly appeared between the two, both his hands raised in defeat, before the two of you start pulling each other's hair. I don't have hair. Before you guys start fighting, please tell me what you need me here for. Oh, that, Butcher then pointed his knife towards the tall tower that Tempo passed by earlier, please evacuate all the citizens within the impact zone. God damn you guys, Tempo looked towards the tall tower, only to see it slowly crumbling and tilting to the side. Tempo's feet were about to move, but before he could take even a single step. I have this one, please rest. A golden glow appeared beside the tower, and if one were to look and squint their eyes, one could see a human within the bright golden luminescence. The individual's hair was gold, freely flowing in the air as he floated, the individual's tight. Skin suit was also completely golden. Bulwark. You were here as well. Of course. Bulwark's voice reverberated through Tempo's earbuds as he saw him placing his hand on the tilting tower, and as soon as he did so, a sort of golden force field quickly swallowed the tower, before Bulwark began to carefully lift it above him. And although Bulwark's voice clearly indicated that he was male, his face seemed more akin to that of a beautiful woman as his golden eyes looked down on Tempo. Dot. Since you are not needed there, and as Tempo was busy almost being dragged to the other side, White King's voice echoed through his ear, go and assist Empress in London. I'll send you the coordinates since she is in the air. Sure. I do not need help, White King. And before Tempo could even respond, a sharp and seemingly strict voice pierced his ears. That's the last airbase, White King responded, it would help you better if Tempo is there. I said I do not. On my way. And before the female super called Empress could respond, another drumming echo whispered in the air as Tempo disappeared from his spot. Hmm. Tempo's eyes almost seemed like they completely turned black as he looked at the coordinates sent to him by White King. There were hundreds of screens projected on the shield of his helmet, helping him process which way to go. And soon, after a minute, his feet stopped moving. Greetings, M. Queen. I have arrived just in time for tea. Oh shit, this is high, Tempo's feet were at the edge of a metallic platform, and beneath him was nothing but a sea of clouds. And where art thou, M. Queen? Tempo then mockingly said as he took a few steps back, seriously though, where are you? Tempo's eyes scanned the roof of the colossal floating ship he was now standing on, only to see no signs of anyone other than him. Are you inside the ship? I told you I do not need your help. Blame White King for what's about to happen to you next. What do you? And before Tempo could even finish his words, a terrifying howl hung through the sky like a wail as the colossal ship started to tremble. Shit, and soon. Tempo could see the clouds getting farther and farther away in view. Please don't do what I think you're about to do. Too late. Chapter 87 The Hope Guild, 3, you are listening at NovelFull.audio. Please don't do what I think you're about to do. Too late. Tempo could only crouch down as the clouds that once littered beside his feet were no longer to be seen. And soon, his fingers started to lift from the ground as he felt himself getting lighter and lighter. Several warning signs also appeared on his helmet as he could feel a permeating breeze crawling through his skin, but soon, with the disappearance of the warning signs, the temperature within his suit started to stabilize. You, 
you did this on purpose, didn't you, White King? Tempo then screamed as his surroundings started to turn slightly darker, the light that beautifully surrounded Mother Earth, slowly fading. I apologize belatedly. Tempo could hear White King slightly chuckling from behind the earbuds, I wanted to test if the new suit is capable of withstanding the harsh environments and conditions of space. It is very good to see that it actually is, you used me as a guinea pig. What if it didn't work? You'll survive. And also, Empress is there to save you in case you start choking or something. And as soon as White King finished his words, everything within Tempo's view became slow as he quickly took a few steps back, leaving some sort of skirt of wind with every step as he did so. He then turned his eyes towards where he was just standing a few moments ago, only for him to see the roof splitting open, the debris shooting out at a very slow pace as it ruptured into varying sizes of cracks. However, even with everything else moving slowly, the fist that suddenly emerged from the ruptured floor moved at an almost normal rate, the numerous golden bangles wrapped around its arm dangling freely, and soon, the owner of that fist revealed itself to be a woman. Her eyes were completely blue, her skin was dark and almost silky, a complete contrast with her long white hair that flowed freely in the air. Only restricted by the gold crown she was wearing, which was shaped like a thorny feather on the sides. Like the rest of the members of the Hope Guild, the suit she was wearing had traces of being developed by White King, hers was sort of a soft, gold and black armor that covered her torso, leaving her arms completely free with only the golden bangles to adorn them. The long skirt that was split in the middle she was wearing also snapped in the air, waking Tempo from his stupor. Tempo did not look for long, however, as he remembered that he was currently in space. This, is quite brutal, Tempo then muttered as he could see people floating inside the hole that Empress created. This is better, Empress then let out a small sigh as she stepped back on the roof of the ship, at least this way, their deaths will be quick and almost painless. Empress raised her hand, and as soon as she did so, Tempo quickly disappeared from his spot. Not before cursing White King, of course. F, fuck you, White King. Tempo screamed as he clumsily leaped away from the ship, and even though they were in space, each of his steps still made an echoing sound. And with him gone, Empress slammed her palm on the colossal airship. There was no sound whatsoever, only a deathly silence as the entirety of the ship rippled, its body crumpling ever so slowly, and soon erupted into tiny million pieces. Dot. Tempo, who was watching the view as Earth's gravity once again slowly greeted him, could not help but let out a sigh of relief as he escaped the Empress's wrath. His relieved sighs, however, quickly became that of guilt as he saw the hundreds of people writhing in space. But soon quickly stopping as the merciless expanse of space crushed the last embers of their life. However, once again, his sigh was interrupted as he realized one crucial thing. Wait, can this survive entering back to the atmosphere? That we'll see. W. White King. God. Damn it. Tempo's heavy breaths whispered loudly in the air as he allowed himself to fall on a metallic, but seemingly soft chair. Why do you look so tired, Tempo? Tempo's sighs were then quickly overpowered by whirring noise that whistled in the air. The sound that V's mecha suit was making whenever she stepped out of it. Her green eyes, emitting statics of electricity as she sat on the chair in front of her, leaving her mecha suit standing behind her. Maybe it's also time to kick you out of the guild and replace you with someone younger. V then said as she smiled at Tempo. What do you mean tired? Tempo quickly raised his voice as he slammed the table in the center of them, I am always the one cleaning all of your mess. And why are you always talking about having someone kicked out? I'm just saying, Veet shrugged her shoulders before rolling her glowing eyes. Why? That's enough. And before Tempo could even rebuke, words filled with authority echoed throughout the white and bright hall they were in, why are the two of you always acting like children? V and Tempo then quickly leaned back to their seats, before looking to the side to avoid each other's gazes, and beside them, were the other members of the Hope Guild, already seated and just watching the two of them with an amused expression on their faces. 
The hall they were in emitted a white light on all corners, with multiple giant monitors attached to the wall, showing different cities in the view of a satellite. Is everyone here? The voice filled with authority once again echoed throughout the hall as Empress approached the others, confidently walking before flicking her long skirt to the side as she took a seat at the center of the V-shaped table. Present. V was the first to raise her hand. Here, here, Tempo said with a small sigh. I am here as you required, Butcher whispered, his arms crossed and his knives on the table. Always at your service, ma'am, Bulwark saluted, his golden eyes flickering as he did so. Let's just get this over with, I still have a modeling gig later, Hera lazily whispered as she rested her arms on the table. Dot. 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 A few seconds passed with no one speaking until finally, Empress let out a small sigh as she turned her eyes towards V's mecha suit. And as soon as she did so, White King stepped out from behind it. Sorry, I was repairing something, White King then said as he waved his hand, before proceeding to sit next to Empress. We've destroyed all of the bases, correct? Empress quickly breathed out as soon as everyone was accounted for. According to my informant, that is all of them, White King nodded. And are we truly sure this informant could be trusted? Empress slightly leaned closer to White King's seat. Everything he or she said has been true so far, White King once again nodded, I thoroughly analyzed everything with the database, everything checked out. But there's no data on their leader. Empress squinted her eyes. Only that my informant referred to her as Dot She. Chapter 88 between a royal and a woman you are listening at novel full dot audio. She. So the leader of the dark millennium is a woman. So their leader really isn't Dark Day. Hera then joined in on the conversation, clicking her tongue as she checked her finely manicured nails, I was hoping to fight him again. I believe you are lying, Hera, Butcher then opened his eyes as he looked Hera in the eyes, you almost died in the last battle. If it was not for Mega Woman fighting Dark Day's main body, then the chances of you dying was at 100%. Shut your balding head, red eyes, Hera returned Butcher's gaze with a glare. It is not just you, Hera, Butcher shook his head, the percent of all of us dying without Mega Woman there was at 100%. TCH. Butcher's words were then followed by a painful silence. Only broken with Empress's sigh. Enough speaking of Dark Day. He has not shown himself for months, allowing us to breathe, Empress said as she waved her hand, thank you all for responding to my call. I know you're busy doing your duties with your own countries. Hmm. Just a little, this is important, though. You may return to your lives, Empress then said as she stood up, however, our mission is still ongoing. Finding the Dark Millennium's leader. And make sure you wipe out any traces of us annihilating the Dark Millennium, she then said as she looked at White King. Already have, White King raised his thumb. All right, all of you may leave. And as soon as she said that, the members of the Hope Guild quickly stood all at the same time. Except for you, White King. Please stay. Dot. The other members looked at each other with slightly furrowed eyebrows as they heard Empress's words but continued to leave without a word after a few seconds. White King looked at the leaving members, and as soon as everyone was gone, his helmet opened up and quickly folded into his pauldrons. What's up? L.RG and as soon as White King turned around, he felt a warm touch placed upon his lips. Dot. White King's mind paused for a few seconds before he leaned his head back and his arms quickly pushed away the source of the warmth. We can't, Empress. Call me by my name, Bernard, Empress's eyebrows quickly furrowed as White King pushed her away. Dot. Dot. Adiz, White King whispered, we can't keep doing this. I have a wife and kids. You had a wife and a kid before. That was when Hannah was just born. I. I was so confused at that time that. You say that but you're the one who came back to me, remember. 
Empress's voice became soft as she grabbed White King's hand, or are you only using me whenever you're troubled? What do you think I am? Just, let's not, White King quickly shook her hand away, that, that time I thought Dark Day would kill us all. I was just. Let's just stop this. The others are already getting suspicious. For one of the smartest people I know, you're also the most oblivious one, Empress muttered, they already know about us. I am in love with you, Bernard. No. I love you. And I love my wife, White King then said as he turned to leave. You wouldn't have slept with me if you did. Dot. White King did not respond, but instead his helmet once again covered his head as he stepped out of the bright hall. Dot. Dot. With her left alone in the guild hall, Empress once again sat back on her seat, quickly placing both her hands on her forehead as she let out a long and very deep breath, a breath that soon stuttered. Why? Empress breathed out as tears started to trail on her face, why? Does it have to be you? Empress, White King, Tempo, Bulwark, Hera, V, and Butcher, all grade. S supers. Together, they form the leading and number one superhero group in the world. The Hope Guild. Damn. What's the occasion? Why is everyone suddenly out and not emo anymore? Gary could be seen leaping into the air, his palms above his eyes as he looked at the almost thousand people gathered in front of the academy gates. That weren't you informed? Hannah answered him as she slightly pushed him to the side, most of the students' families will be staying in the academy now. Oh. Gary quickly stopped hopping around as he looked Hannah straight in the eyes, then let me come with you guys. Why? So I can meet my future mother. In. Law. Go fuck yourself. Why don't the both of us do that to me? Gary repeatedly raised both his eyebrows. Go away, man. Bother your own family, Hannah waved both her hands, gesturing to Gary to leave. Well. I don't really have any family here. Fine, Hannah sighed as she heard Gary's words, but don't say anything unnecessary or I will crush your balls myself. Or worse, Riley will do it. I will do no such thing, sister, Riley, who was keeping quiet on the side, quickly furrowed his eyebrows as soon as he heard his sister's words, I find it very disgusting that you would even propose such a thing. E.W. Why do I feel like I should be relieved and hurt at the same time? Gary muttered as his eye began to twitch, anyway, where's the other two? Sylvie and Tomo. Hannah breathed out, Sylvie will be here any minute now, but as for Tomo, she isn't really answering any of my calls. I smell parental issues, we shall visit her in her room later as good friends. That you're not allowed in the female's building. Not allowed, or not advised. Gary once again raised both his eyebrows repeatedly. Gary and Hannah continued to bicker for a few more minutes, before Hannah slightly moved closer to Riley. Speaking of people that should be here. Hannah said, her voice turning colder by the second, why is she here? She then roared as her fingers pointed towards the silver. Haired woman standing beside Riley. Because mother wants to meet her, Riley quickly answered after taking a glance at Catherine, I think she is excited because she has heard a lot of things about her from you, sister. Oh. Hannah's eyes suddenly became slanted as she heard Riley's words, this should be good then. Dot. Catherine, who was quietly standing on the side, could not help but twitch her eyes as Hannah's mocking chuckle whispered through her ears. Although she might sound crazy saying it, but out of all the things that she had done for Riley, this was probably the most nervous she has been, even having a hand in killing all of those innocent people couldn't compare to what she was feeling right now. Ah, it's opening. Gary then once again leaped in the air as a loud humming noise reverberated in the air, I'm so excited to meet my future mother. In. Guck. And before Gary could even finish his words, his balls landed straight towards Hannah's fist. And with the pained roar that almost reached the heavens, the other students that were near them could not help but move away due to the sheer force of second-hand discomfort they were feeling. W, Y. This, this was for you. 
Gary's dying words, however, were heard by none as Hannah and the others were busy looking at the colossal armored trucks and tanks entering the academy. Most of them could not help but slightly let out small gasps as they did not expect them to come rolling in with military equipment, but ever since the incident, it would seem the government was already putting every expense into safeguarding the people in the academy. There were also super dot soldiers and heavy tanks blocking the gates as they closed. Making sure no one would be able to get in. And finally, after all of that charade, the students' families began stepping out of the armored vehicles one by one. They were asked by the staff to go out in a leisurely and relaxed manner, but as soon as they saw the faces of their children, they all rushed to hug them. Do you see mom? I have, Riley muttered as he raised his hand, and as soon as he did so, a woman emerged and floated from the crowd, and slowly, the woman hovered towards them. R. Riley. I thought it was you. P, please, drop me down. It's embarrassing. Very well, mother. Riley quickly dropped his hand, and as soon as he did so, her mother came falling down from the air. Riley. Catherine was about to summon a puff of wind below Diana, but before she could do so, Diana suddenly started spinning in the air. Dot. And with extreme agility, she landed on the ground elegantly, letting out a confident smirk as she looked at her children. And without even saying a word, she rushed towards them and hugged them, Riley, however, quickly dodged to the side. This, is a really weird family, don't you think so, Teach? Gary then whispered as he finally recovered from his misfortune. Weird. Weird was an understatement. The two could only watch as Diana relentlessly violently tried to hug Riley, only for Riley to evade her advance with what seemed like Tai Chi. And if their eyes weren't fooling them, Diana's hands were getting faster and faster. Were they really sure Diana wasn't a super? And after a few more seconds of this, Diana then looked towards Catherine, her breath still heavy from having to chase Riley around. So. Diana then squinted her eyes as she approached Catherine, you're the instructor. Dating my son. Chapter 89. Reunions you are listening at novelfull.audio. Dot. 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 When, when do you think Sylvie and Tomo gonna come? Shut it, Gary. I. I was just asking bruh. Gary could only slouch deeper into his seat as the tone of Hannah's voice almost buried him alive. He was used to Hannah being violent and fussy, but it was never to this level of heaviness. They were in their usual hideout. Or perhaps it could be said to be their superhero cave now, the Korean shaved ice store. And it was supposed to be cold in the shop but Gary could feel himself sweating from the heavy atmosphere hissing in the air. Gary's eyes then turned towards Charlotte, as if begging her to do something about this situation like she did last time. But alas, Charlotte just quickly avoided his eyes, fidgeting with her cashier's terminal even though there weren't even any customers. Seeing as Charlotte was completely ignoring them, the only thing that he could do was look back and forth across the people at his table. Hannah, Catherine, Riley, and his mother, Diana. Of course, if he already found the situation incredibly uncomfortable and nerve-dot-racking, what more Catherine? Catherine was now feeling something that she couldn't explain. Riley's mother said she wanted to talk to her, but so far, Diana has only been quietly sitting at her seat without even saying a word for almost half an hour now. There was a smile plastered on her face. Her heart, however, almost deafened Catherine from how fast it was beating, she wouldn't be surprised if Diana just fainted right here and now. Just say what you want to say already. Catherine thought as she returned Diana's smile. Where will you be staying in the academy, mother? But finally, after a few more seconds of this awkward and chilling silence, Riley was the first to speak. And soon, finally, Diana also broke her silence but not to answer her son's question. How old are you, Scarlet Mage? But instead looked at Catherine straight in the eyes, her tone completely cold, her smile, however, still stood strong. I'm 28, 
Mrs. Ross, Catherine quickly answered, but not without taking in a gulp mid-sentence. How old do you think Riley is? Point one seven. He is sixteen, Scarlet Mage. Barely. I am actually seventeen years old now, mother, Riley interrupted the conversation. What? My birthday already passed inside the academy, mother, Riley mentioned, you even told father to greet me on your behalf. When, when did that happen? A couple months ago, mother, Riley said. Dot. Diana squinted her eyes at Riley, before once again focusing her attention on Catherine, e. Either way, he just passed the age of consent. You tell her, mom. Hannah added, her head always facing the ceiling as she tried her best to look down on Catherine. My son is still very young and ignorant about the world, Diana then let out a sigh, I am afraid that you are preying on his innocence. What exactly is it that you want from him? That's. What was she even supposed to say? That Riley has her mother hostage and that she was actually just a slave to him. Or that. I am in love with your son, Mrs. Ross. Oh, shit. Gary, whose eyes were still carefully watching the scenery unfold in front of him, could not help but rise from his seat, however, his head was quickly slammed to the table by Hannah as she stood up. Love. Do you even know what you... I see, and before Hannah could even finish her raging words, Diana raised her hand and gestured for her to calm down. And seeing the serious look on her mother's face, the only thing Hannah could do was obey. And what about you, Riley? Diana then said as she looked at her son, what do you feel about her? I am incapable of feeling love, mother. Yes, yes, Diana quickly waved her hand, but what do you feel about her? What is her role to you? Dot. Riley glanced at Catherine for a few seconds, before turning his head back to where he was previously looking, she is very important to my daily operations, mother. I can't do the things I have been doing now as efficiently without her help. I, see. And soon, Diana's shoulders began to tremble, and if one focused their ears, one could hear her whispering something. M, mom. Please, calm down, Hannah then said as she slightly moved away from Diana, see what you did, Riley. You made her. My son finally has a girlfriend. Hannah then almost stumbled to the ground as Diana suddenly stood up from her seat, raising her hand as she moved closer towards Catherine and Riley. She then grabbed her phone from her bag and started taking pictures of them. W, W, what are you doing, Mom? Hannah said as she tried to grab the phone from her mother's hand, but alas, she was weirdly fast. Interesting, Riley muttered as she saw the phone, you were allowed to bring in your phones, mother. No, Diana shook her hand as she continued taking photos of Riley and Catherine, they gave it to us when we were in the van. Dot. Riley squinted his eyes as soon as he heard his mother's words. The students were allowed to have phones. And now even the families. The government was so secretive of the academy at first, but now it felt like they wanted them to be shown to the outside world. Just what exactly is their plan? It was definitely something they couldn't do when Mega Woman was still present. He should probably have Catherine check in on. Mom. I thought you were on my side about this. Betty Edie his thoughts were then completely disrupted as Hannah's body began to emit fumes, causing Charlotte to panic as their store's display started melting one by one. I am, dear, Diana then stopped taking photos as she let out a sigh, but I am also on your brother's side. You know, throughout his growing up, I always thought that he was never going to have a girlfriend. T, that's not. And to think his first girlfriend will be this hot. Is your silver hair natural? Or did you have it bleached somewhere? S, something like that. Catherine could not help but move to the side as Diana suddenly scooched over beside her. Mom, what are you? Rather than that, Diana's tone then suddenly became serious as she looked at Hannah, you're already turning twenty in a few months, when are you going to get a boyfriend? What? This isn't about me. Why, hello there, 
future mother. In. Law. And before Hannah could even say another word, Gary stood up and quickly kneeled in front of Diana, gently holding her hand and smiling at her. Oh my, Diana chuckled, such a muscular young fella. Could it be? No. He's not my boyfriend. Please don't continue your words. What Hannah said is right, future mother. In. Law, Gary then let out a long and deep sigh as he let go of Diana's hand, but soon, I will conquer her heart and I can finally truly call you, my mother. My, how thoughtful of you, Hannah, Diana once again chuckled as she looked at her daughter, for you to befriend another boy like your brother, who would think you were this compassionate. What? Hannah raised an eyebrow. This boy is in the spectrum as well, no. Dot. 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 And so, for the first time ever, Gary had his mouth completely shut. There were many more reunions happening all around the academy, most are happy, some with tears of joy, and some also filled with pain and pretending. Tomo Reynolds, we brought your mother here. Tomo was currently inside her apartment, the only light that could be seen was from her phone that reflected through her eyes. And even with the almost endless knocking resounding in the room, her eyes did not leave the phone one bit as they continued to stare at videos and photos of Riley. Tomo Reynolds, your mother is here to see you. Tomo. It's fine. Dot. And as soon as a different voice seeped from the door, Tomo's eyes suddenly began to flicker. But after a few seconds, they returned to normal as she once again stared at her phone. I'll just see her later when she is not tired. That's very well, Mrs. Reynolds. Let me at least escort you to the family villa. Dot, dot. And as soon as she was sure that there weren't any more people outside her apartment, she quickly stood up from the bed, quickly leaving the room as soon as she got dressed. Tomo was one of the few who refused to see their parents, there were also those who met with their family, but in the end, did not really have the reunion they imagined. Father. Sylvie was in her apartment, her body completely straight as her eyes followed the man walking around her room, which was free of any unnecessary items, almost immaculate, even. The man continued to walk, his fingers trailing on the wall as he did so. And after a few more seconds of doing this, he stopped to check on his fingers, nodding as soon as he checked that there were no signs of dust sticking on them. Good, the man nodded his glasses slightly sliding down the bridge of his nose as he did so. The man had the same hair color as Sylvie. A gold with a brown shade, tied into a ponytail. About the incident that happened, are you okay now? The man then said as he stood in front of Sylvie. Yes, thank you for your concern, father. I heard it was during the festival. Yes. Were you winning your event? I would like to think so, father. Itchem, that is good to know. D. Dad. Sylvie's body then began to relax as she heard her father sigh. Hmm. My, friends and I actually agreed to meet after this. They are waiting for me right now, Sylvie muttered as she slightly looked to the side, glancing at her father from time to time, Can, can you come with me to meet them? Friends. Sylvie's father breathed out, you have made friends here. Why, yes, Sylvie smiled, you should come with. I'm tired, Sylvie's father shook his head before she could finish her words, tell them I will meet them next time. That's. Go ahead, Sylvie's father let out a small smile as he gestured to Sylvie to leave, I'll find my way through the academy on my own. Dot. Okay, father, Sylvie once again stood straight trying her best not to bite her lip, please, take your rest. Hmm, Sylvie's father watched as Sylvie left the apartment, before shaking his head with a sigh, that I knew this was a bad idea. One would be surprised that Sylvie is not alone with this kind of reunion, as there were also many who wanted to please their parents. There are also reunions, however, that involved a subtle, malice. Is what you said on the phone true? Yes, father. The one cursed by God is here. 